The subject of justice is ordinarily thought of as an issue of rights, of giving one what, one what is due, of respecting one's individual dignity, and so forth. But this, as it happens, is a relatively late addition to questions of justice. For neither the ancient Greek nor the ancient Roman world devoted much time, or papyrus, to the matter of individual rights as such. And as for one's dignity, in the ancient world this was a property hard won and easily lost, often in a moment. To the extent that Socrates, for example, may be said to have had justice as a central concern, the concept applied rather more to the criteria by which we judge a person's character than to the question of whether the state has been the source of justice. In Plato's Republic, justice in the state is what leads to harmony and peace, but in the individual it takes the form of a selfless and rational commitment to do the right thing in the moral sense of right. For Aristotle, justice in the sense of the actions of the state is simply the virtue of the magistrate, and in any case is more or less a matter of convention and of law. So too with Cicero. Now, the point is not that justice is not of crucial importance in ancient philosophy. Rather, it is too important to be reduced to institutional functions or merely personal expectations. Justice is a virtue. Virtues inhere in persons. There cannot be a just state populated by felons. So if we're interested in theories of justice advanced by leading ancient philosophers, we will find texts rich in character analysis and in examples of how the just and the unjust person behave and behave toward others. But there'll be far less on the rights individuals have in relation to others and to the entire community. Now this much noted, there are of course discussions of certain principles of justice such as equity and the fair distribution of goods. The emphasis is on reasonableness and moderation as might be expected of Plato, Aristotle, Cicero and the rest. As with all the virtues, justice is of intrinsic value such that it would be odd to ask about its, in, about its instrumental or cash value. What we would take to be a principle of justice is in ancient Greek philosophy a dictate of reason, a reflection of the character of the actor, less attention paid to what another is due, so to speak, than what is revealed by those who fail to pay what is due. When Socrates claims that he would far prefer to be the victim of injustice than its cause, he gives voice to this understanding. Justice is what we are each obliged to strive for in our association with others and our dealings with the world. Now lest there be confusion on this point, let me repeat that there is an ancient background or intellectual framework for all conceptions of justice as we would understand the term today. It is established by the ancient Greek conception of a cosmic rational order, which makes clear that a comparable rational order is the natural state of affairs for human societies. Plato and Aristotle both emphasize this, and the Stoic philosophers make it the linchpin of their moral philosophy. Now justice on this basis is but another face of rationality itself, now turned to the manner in which persons are governed and must govern themselves. As rational beings they ought to be ruled by law rather than by force, and actions by and toward them then now carry a burden of justification. One can always ask when one is being constrained in one's actions, by what right do you do that or what is the reason you're doing that? This line of thought, though foundational for all developed ideas of justice, does not conclude in any clear statements of universal human rights. Once we remove this conception of justice as virtue and turn to conceptions of social justice or the rights of man, so to speak, the ancient world actually has much less to say. The same Aristotle who defines man generically as a rational animal, thus conferring the power of rationality on humanity at large, will insist that it is right nonetheless that, quote, Hellenes shall rule barbarians. 
Plato's Republic is famously anti-democratic, committed to eugenic forms of human breeding and classes structured on meritocratic grounds. Slavery, of course, is commonplace in all of the recorded history of the ancient worlds, and though routinely justified as one of the wages of defeat in war, slavery is often predicated on the belief that some persons or tribes or religious groups or races are simply inferior to their enslaving masters. When Aristotle in the politics begins his discussion of those he refers to as natural slaves, the person as a natural slave, the, the thulos fusikos, he does note that some regard slavery to be wrong in all instances, but he's unable to produce the names of those who are opposed to slavery in all cases. The Stoic philosophers, as I've noted, do impose rigorous standards of reasonableness on laws and on social behavior, locating our right, as it were, to such treatment in our unique possession of language. But again, we do not find in their works arguments for the abolition of slavery. Perhaps the closest we come to the universalizing and the individuating of rights is in some of the precepts of the ancient cynics. Diogenes comes to mind. Diogenes lived from 412 to 323 BC. He was a leader of this school of philosophy, the cynic school. It was a radically democratic uh, uh, philosophical school, radically democratic in its political philosophy, opposed to all forms of pretense, to class hierarchies, and yes, opposed to slavery as well. But here too, however, notions of universal brotherhood did not capture the sense of rights as such, but something more akin to a naturalism that requires social and political life to be stripped of what is merely artificial or self-serving. Now, perhaps the most significant development in conceptions of justice was that introduced by the early church fathers, and especially St. Augustine in his discussion of conscience and freedom of the will. Now, this interiorization of morals was intended to liberate conscience from mere convention. Justice on this account is obedience to God's law, which may place a person in adversarial relationship with others, with the state. That this idea is Neoplatonist is actually irrelevant to the progress in the world of politics and law in the centuries in which Christianity was the dominating perspective. Augustine is also important for his comments on slavery in Book 19 of The City of God. He says, Now as our Lord above says, Everyone who commits sin is sin's slave. And this is why, though many devout men are slaves to unrighteous masters, yet the masters they serve are not themselves free. It is a happier lot to be a slave to a human being than to a lust, and in fact the most pitiless domination that devastates the hearts of men is that exercised by this very lust for domination. Ah. Well, trenchant as was this teaching, it did little to extend justice to those regarded as of low standing. If John Locke is to be regarded as the prophet of American liberty, and I have serious reservations about that, it is useful to recall his participation in the drafting of the Constitution for Carolina in 1669. In the very preamble to that document, Locke wrote that the Constitution was to prevent, quote, a numerous democracy, close quote. And the document made express provision in Article 19 for the lord of the manor to, quote, alienate, sell, or dispose to any other person and his heirs forever, his manor, all entirely, entirely together, with all the privileges and leet men thereunto belonging. And the leet men, of course, were the holdover serfs of medieval Europe. Well, to put the point briefly, let me just say that I know of no anti-slavery treatise based on the universal principle of human rights before the 17th century when the Quakers protested the importation of slaves from Africa. So this idea of human rights is a gradually developing idea itself.
Now, there are earlier treatises on human rights apart from the issue of slavery and its abolition. These, interestingly enough, are composed in the two radically different contexts of war and religion. The first is the venerable Magna Carta of 1215 signed by King John at Runnymede. Its provisions include the following, quote, that the English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. This freedom we shall observe ourselves and desire to be observed in good faith by our heirs in perpetuity. We have also granted to all free men of our realm, for us and our heirs forever, all the liberties written out below to have and to keep for them and their heirs of us and our heirs. Now note that the liberties and freedoms pertain to church elections and are reserved only to the free men of the realm. This is not a document affirming universal rights, nor does it focus on the individual as the bearer of such rights. But it does lay the foundation for principles that will become more sharply defined in the Reformation and thereafter as to the limits on royal prerogatives in the matter of religion and indeed the limits on clerical authority in the matter of individual conscience. Simply stated, the individuation of rights and the application of principles of justice to the individual person as the bearer of rights, well, all this grows out of claims of religious liberty. By the 18th century, the secular version of this conception of justice requires rule by right reason over and against any rule based on no more than revelation or custom or tradition. In a different context, now the context of warfare and the duties of victors toward the vanquished, there is another path toward the idea of justice, justice as a universal obligation owed to persons as such. Now, this is a quite complex chapter in political and intellectual history, and one must be wary of generalizations. The religious wars between Christians and Muslims featured the execution of infidels on both sides of the lines of battle. And it was this same mentality that the Spanish conquistadors brought with them to the New World. Their brutality toward the native population was relentless. There seems to be little that some won't do to a body in order to save a soul. Well, out of that experience, however, would come a most significant teaching on what we may properly refer to as the rights of man. I refer here to Francisco de Vitoria's De Indies. This uh, is a man, 1480 to 1546. His De Indies and his De Juri Belli Relectiones, the first including his considerations of the Indians of the New World, and the second his lectures on what? On just war. Now, the published version of these lectures, he was professor of theology at the University of Salamanca, would not appear in print until the end of the 17th century. But he had such great intellectual standing, it was such that the ideas themselves would be influential before they appeared in print, influential as a result of his teaching. There is much of interest and importance in Vittoria's lectures, not the least of which is the requirement that in war, as little harm is produced as is consistent with the need for victory. I'll return to this later in lecture. But here I draw attention to his insistence that God's laws apply to the children of God and would preserve them from torture and torment. The religious ignorance or waywardness of a people cannot justify inhumane acts toward them. The just war. Well, what is a just war? Now, in chapter 17 of Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian War, written in 431 BC, there's a dialogue between the Athenian military and the citizens of the island state of Milos, the famous Melian Dialogue. In the complex politics of the ancient Greek world, the main competitors for power were Athens and Sparta, each with a set of client states. Milos, notwithstanding to the contrary their denials in the dialogue, was clearly on the Spartan side, at least, in this dispute. 
Now, the Athenian expeditionary force numbered nearly 40 ships and thousands of infantry and archers, clearly sufficient to reduce Milos to rubble. When asked to justify their occupation of the island, the Athenians first speak of the Melian allegiance to Sparta, but clearly do not intend the discussion to go very far. Indeed, they soon ref reply to further questions with this statement of brute fact, quote, For ourselves, we shall not trouble you with specious pretenses, either of how we have a right to our empire, or are now attacking you because of a wrong that you have done us. Since you know as well as we, you surely know as well as we do, that right, as the world goes, is only a question between those equal in power, while the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. Well, what could be clearer? It is might that makes right, except where powers are so equal, uh, as to require each side to look for some other basis upon which to gain an advantage, the other basis being maybe precious pretenses, or what we are pleased to call moral arguments. Well, the Melians remind their Athenians, that uh, these Athenians, that their, the position being advocated here violates their own developed principles of justice and equity. But, of course, this gets them nowhere. Rather, their surrender, they are told, will be the best for everyone, for it will spare them the consequences of total destruction, and will spare the Athenians the cost of accomplishing their total destruction. This is obviously not Aristotle or Plato speaking. Now that the ancient world had a conception of the just war, there is no doubt, for the terms of such a war are developed in the, in the Homeric epics themselves. Consider Athena's final counsel to Odysseus in behalf of peace. And consider as well the price that all must pay for what is disproportionate or irrational in battle. Again, this is justice and reason rather than justice as rights, but it's a developed conception of justice nonetheless. And the same is obvious from the details of ancient Greek and Roman law, replete with trial procedures, rules of evidence, the attempt to fit punishments to the nature of the offense, the allegiance of leaders to the rule of law, and the condemnation of tyrants. I repeat, the ancient understandings do inform all later understandings of justice. Inform, but do not determine them. Rather, to the ancient understandings must be added a rich and various contribution from, yes, Christian theology. The addition to the classical virtues of the theological virtues that centrally include charity, that's an addition that is a profound addition. The stipulation that, quote, mercy is the perfection of justice, close quote, now adds to justice a decent respect for human dignity, for the standing of the person as a child of God. Justice now is measured against motives, and the motives must be faithful to what? Well, faithful to the faith. Now that all this is routinely violated in the actual affairs of state is of course lamentable, but the standards of justice are nevertheless clearly developed. Now within the context of Christian teaching, the two most significant writers on the subject of just war were St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Augustine may well be credit credited with inaugurating the tradition itself in his treatise, The City of God. Having made clear that at the personal level, only self-defense can justify the use of lethal force, well, at the level of nation-states, there is a larger purpose served, namely the preservation of peace. Thus, says Augustine, we do not seek peace in order to be at war, but we go to war that we may have peace. Be peaceful, therefore, in warring, so that you may vanquish those whom you war against and bring them to the prosperity of peace. Aristotle had made the same observation in the Nicomachean Ethics. We make war so that we may live in peace. But as the aim of peace is won at the very heavy price of war. It must be the aim of peace alone that is envisaged. As Augustine says, specifically ruled out as permissible motives or justifications are, quote, 
the passion for inflicting harm, the cruel thirst for vengeance, the lust of power. Close quote. Now, with Thomas Aquinas, there is the full development of a theory of just war. Christian duty to seek peace seems inconsistent with war in any form, and it is Aquinas' attempt to remove that inconsistency that results in what he offers as the sole justifications for war. Here's Thomas Aquinas, quote, In order for a war to be just, three things are necessary. First, the authority of the sovereign by whose command the war is to be waged. For it is not the business of a private individual to declare war, because he can seek for redress of his rights from the tribunal of his superior. Secondly, a just cause is required, namely, that those who are attacked should be attacked because they deserve it on account of some fault. Thirdly, it is necessary that the belligerents should have a rightful intention so that they intend the advancement of good or the avoidance of evil. Now, there are different considerations applicable to the justification for going to war. The use ad bellum and the justified actions that take place once one is in war, the use in bello. Aquinas, Aquinas's actually stand as the first criterion addressing the question of legitimate authority for waging war. As his natural law theory regards law itself as an ordinance of reason promulgated by one responsible for the good of the community, it's then only by way of the sovereign power of princes and states that war could be justly waged. In modern terms we would say that whatever it is they're doing, terrorists are not waging war, do you see? Not just sovereigns attempting to secure good. So in light of the costs of war and the inevitable loss of innocent life, the cause must be just, the war itself must be the last in a series of measures designed to achieve peace, and there must be a reasonable chance of success. War, in other words, is never to be a futile gesture. And finally, the measures must satisfy the requirement of proportionality, such that the war inflicts no greater harm than is necessary to achieve the just aims of peace. Now, once the war has begun, the jus in bello, there are comparable principles determining what can be justly done in the prosecution of a war. Again, the main criterion is proportionality, along with the recognized immunity of non-combatants. Now, refinements of this sort were added over the centuries by such theorists as Francisco Suarez, 1548 to 1617, Francisco de Vitoria, whom I've mentioned within the context of Roman Catholic theory, Hugo Grotius, 1583 to 1645, a Protestant natural law theorist. These refinements require that the warring party seek no more than the advancement of what is good or the avoidance of evil. There must be the avoidance of evil. Thus, the war must be waged with restraint, applying no greater force than what is needed to secure a desired good. Its motivation must not be corrupted by considerations of merely personal gain in the form of wealth or power. For a war to be just, the cause must be just, and that requires that the enemy be justly regarded as a source of evil. Now, if these are principles that are at least plausibly uh, classifiable uh, for what makes a war a just war, warfare as serving the interests of justice, then we might ask whether they are, mutatis mutandis, applicable to relationships between the individual and the state. That is, if a nation may justly make war to secure peace and resist evil, might it not also impose coercively on citizens forms of conduct and of life also consistent with peace and decency. Now within the liberal tradition, the state's justifiable use of force has been limited to the prevention of harm. John Stuart Mill made the harm principle the prime justification for constraint of individual liberty. But of course this is really unhelpful until and unless the category of harms is worked out with some precision. 
to the harm principle, some have argued for the addition of offense and even nuisance. That is, harm is not the sole effect from which others should be spared by the police power of the state. Citizens should also be protected against actions so patently offensive as to diminish the dignity of civic life itself. And protected as well from actions whose nuisance value is such as to frustrate the legitimate activities of fellow citizens. Coercive constraints in such cases must be applied in a measured and proportionate fashion, the motive again not corrupted by self-serving factors. But of course the problem with this reasonable paradigm is that it leaves about as much room as any theorist requires to support excessive forms of state paternalism as well as excessive forms of state paralysis. What standards are to be applied to notions of offense and nuisance, or for that matter, harm? Uh, many students of human development believe there is convincing evidence to the effect that pornography has a deleterious effect on children, even on adult relationships. It is harmful, in addition to being grossly offensive. And when sold or featured in local, local establishments, it constitutes a public nuisance as well. Now, to say that it is protected by the First Amendment, as if that disposed of the matter, is to fail to acknowledge all varieties of speech and publication not protected by the First Amendment, libelous utterances, statements likely to provoke violence and civil unrest, statements advocating the violent overthrow of the government. What seems to be at issue is not the limitations imposed by the First Amendment, but the more general limitations that the liberal state imposes on the application of its own state power. Paternalism is nearly unavoidable, of course, except in total anarchies. The compulsory education of children is one expression of it, as are laws requiring seat belts or denying the right to smoke in public places, forbidding the sale of alcohol to minors. Provable harm is not invariably at issue in these contexts. Nor are those opposed to state paternalism comparably opposed to state welfareism. John Rawls, for example, requires a hands-off policy in the matter of individual liberty, but a hands-on policy in compensating for market inequalities in wealth and opportunity. Well, virtue, of which justice is an instance, cannot be reduced to a formula, nor manifested in the form of trappings and slogans. Justice in the state is brought about by just citizens, by just magistrates and legislators. To the extent that, at least metaphorically, we can speak of the state as virtuous, we can mean only that its institutions and practices are designed to promote virtue and to oppose evil, designed to make war on evil in ways that are proportionate, non-arbitrary, respectful of the potentialities, if not the current standing, of one or another individual. The virtuous state, as with the virtuous person, is not controlled by the passing enthusiasms of majorities or the sophistical and skeptical challenges of the pedant. Do good and avoid evil is a command accessible to those with common sense and with sufficient civic breeding to understand how their actions contribute to the very tone of life, their own included. Nothing will serve them better than a political world in which the rule is the rule of law, understood to be an ordinance of reason, and ideally promulgated by one who has the good of the community as his responsibility, be that a parliament, a congress, a president, or a king. And to do these things, and to do them virtually, is to presuppose a community accessible to a virtuous form of life. That form of paternalism is the royal rule that Aristotle speaks of, not the command of the tyrant, but the guidance of the good prince.